Support for the Trailblazers.fm podcast comes from the Campaign for Black Male Achievement, a vibrant network of leaders and organizations working on the ground to drive positive outcomes for our black men and boys. To learn more or to join and help CBME change the narrative, hop on over right now to tbpod.com slash black male achievement. You're listening to the Trailblazers podcast, where we will explore the stories of successful Black professionals. Join us as we highlight the knowledge, resources, and tools of these accomplished trailblazers to help provide the know-how, confidence, and motivation you need to blaze your trail. And now, here's your host, Stephen Hart. What's up, Blazer Nation? Thank you so much for joining us today. Listen up, last Thursday, we did an exclusive live masterclass for some of you interested in building and or improving and growing your personal brand and your online home. And we're going to be doing an encore of that masterclass. Yes, another live personal branding masterclass is going to happen next Thursday, April 5th at 8 p.m. Eastern. I invite you, join us, come get your marketing and branding questions answered. You can sign up right now over at stephenahart.com slash webinar. Now, our featured guest for today is a trailblazer in the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area, which we call a DMV. And whether on stage, in the classroom, in the community, or as a father, Marcus Johnson leaves a mark wherever he lands. Musician, entrepreneur, professor, author motivational speaker. He's a consummate dreamer doer, and he believes that investing in a community and in one's self is the best way to solve some of life's most pressing questions, right? Why are we here? What is our purpose? And in answering these questions for himself, Marcus has successfully navigated the realms of music, business, education, and entrepreneurship. I hope you grab your Evernote, grab a notepad. There's going to be some good wisdom in this interview. Here's my conversation with Marcus Johnson. Enjoy. Marcus, welcome. And thanks so much for being our featured guest on today's episode, my brother. It's absolutely my pleasure, man. Thank you so much for having me. So hard to believe, right? We're fast approaching the end of the year. (laughs) I can't believe it. Often remind folks that days are long, but years are short. And as you reflect on this year, maybe share with us what's an unexpected blessing that you maybe didn't plan for, but you're extremely grateful for it happening. Wow, man. They're unexpected blessings. Number one, uh, on the business side, getting a deal to get Flow Wine into North Carolina and Food Lion stores, about 320 of those was awesome. And then also to find out we're going to expand into California and Georgia in 2018 was very awesome. Some things on the personal side, you know, honestly, having a good lady in my life has been uh, an amazing thing for me, having gone through the regular relationship stuff that we go through. And I mean, you know, everybody has, or every relationship has its dynamics, but having and finding somebody that's a partner that's uh, forward thinking has been amazing. And I think the most incredible is actually I'm getting along with my child's mom, who is not that particular person, but, you know, and the things that we're doing to work together for the the betterment of our, our child. I mean, those are, you know, a couple of, of things that have been Great. I think on the larger scene, though, it's been awesome to watch the positives that have come out of this post-election dynamic with all of the, say, we'll call it issues and things that we've been presented with under this Mm -hmm. new, you know, administration. And I've had more conversations with people who look like me and or think like me and or are sympathetic and understand that not everyone who is in a position of, you say, uh, of lesser status is there because they're lazy. They recognize that there are dynamics that go beyond our abilities, our intellect, 
and they do all that they can to support us. And I, I've had more meetings with great people this year because they've had to come out from under the woodworks, just like the equivalent has on what I'll call the um, not so loving side of things. Mm. <laughs> um, that to me, it is a heartening experience. And I think in the long run, you know, as they say, you know, some people meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Amen. And that's, uh, right. that's pretty good. That's, that's right. That's a definite positive dynamic. So Marcus, I can take you back for a little bit. I read that you moved to the DMV from Ohio when you're about 12 <laughs> years old. Is that right? Actually, no, when I was two years old. When you're two years old. Yeah, man. Wow. My father was a yeah, professor at Ohio State and then got a professorial uh, position at Howard along with my mother. And uh, we moved when I was two. Wow. Wow. But I'm a Buckeye till I die. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Love it. So I wanted to confirm something with you. I believe mm -hmm. that you delivered the 2004 commencement speech to students at your alma mater, Montgomery Blair. Yes, that was a that's an honor, you know, to to go to a high school and, you know, within 15 years or less, actually, mm -hmm. of well, right at 15 years of graduating, to be asked by the principal to still come back and give some words of wisdom. I did that with a pride, an unequaled pride, and got a lot of positives out of that. It was an interesting time in my life. I had done a couple of deals and, you know, to be able to be in a position to inspire is awesome. So I asked that question because today I was sharing with my wife who I was speaking to. And before I said your name, she's like, are you talking to Marcus Johnson? And I was like, how do you know <laughs> who I'm talking to? Turns out her brother, my brother-in-law, was in that graduating class that you spoke to. And my wife actually just graduated from Georgetown that year. And so she connected to you as a Georgetown alum as well. Wow, that's awesome. A right? small world. It is. Yeah, very much it so. Is. So back when you're a student at Blair, did you envision your life's path kind of carving its way out to what it's evolved into today? You know, not exactly, but yes, I was the kid that was always trying to help others. My mom was concerned. She always used to tease me in the fact that she said I was a social worker, always trying to help other people. But I played sports. I did music. We had this yearly production called The Rock and Soul Show, which was an incredible production, about an hour and a half with 60 to 70 students. And we built a set and all that kind of stuff. So I did music. I did sports. You know, I knew how to dress and, you know, I may have been able to say a couple of uh, smooth things out of my mouth here there. But um, <laughs> the most incredible thing was in my yearbook, my senior year, I wasn't voted, you know, Mr. Congeniality. I wasn't voted, you know, sexiest guy. I was voted most likely to succeed. Wow. And I took that with me and I took that with pride and with thanks for my parents, for God, for putting the, the type of soul and spirit that he did within me to go out and help and make a difference. And that's really what I've been doing. And I continue to do that more. And I look forward to doing more of that as it relates to music. I was in the jazz ensemble and I had one all state, all county was ranked in the nation. I went to the University of Miami where I was the only African American admitted to the music engineering and technology major and program wow. there, which was num number one in the country. And we actually studied recording, uh, digital recording from Ken Pullman, who created digital recording. So, you know, I just had all these experiences that, you know, allowed me to, to create my own path. Now, I will say in the midst of that, my senior year, right before I started, my mother had a stroke. Mm -hmm. I was not expecting that. And that changed kind of the dynamic of one, it shook my understanding of life mm -hmm. because you don't expect at 17 to face the near death experience of your mother. I actually thought she was going to die. And, you know, it took a little while. It shook my faith, you know, in a, in a lot of different ways. I'm sure. But watching her work through it and continue to live, you know, allowed me the fortification of, you know, my idea that if she can do it and she can't walk, if she can do it and she can't see as well as she could, if she can do it and she can't use her left hand, you know, at 100% and can't use her right, then what excuses do any of us have not to go out here and make it work? Yes. So, brother, I appreciate you sharing that. That was, that was powerful. You've, and I, I want to talk about the music in a second, but you've developed this very unique career, right? That <laughs> navigates the realms of music and education and business and entrepreneurship. And 
I'm just curious at the core, what's your mission? What's driving you in the work that you find yourself doing in these different spaces today? Well, you know, I'm in a, in a ton of different spaces and yeah. well, let's say I'm seemingly in a ton of different spaces. However, what it comes back to is while I was reading Howard Schultz's book during the mid 2000s, he had to ask himself the question, you know, where is Starbucks? What business are we in? And they, they came up with the answer, you know, the third place business. You have your house, you have your office, and then you have Starbucks. So when you do that, then you can create a lifestyle around the third place. Mm-hmm. So that was very important to me. And then I understood. I was like, wait a minute, man. If that's the case, then I am technically in the – therapy business. I'm not really in the music industry. I'm not really in the wine industry. I'm not really in the professorial industry or the entrepreneurship industry. I'm in the business of helping people feel better. I use my music in the morning to get ready to drive to work while they're at work, on the way home from work, while they're cooking. And then if you look at the number one target demographic that we have, women, their number one alcoholic beverage is wine. So when you look at it from a therapeutic perspective, there's no better therapy than jazz and wine for your number one target demo. Now you look at your secondary market and guys, and you've got the girls coming to your events and enjoying your wine. Well, they're going to figure out a way to enjoy one thing or the other. But, you know, when I put my mission down and I, I look at the question about like, what am I selling? The real issue is using my wisdom and, uh, you know, those are my successes and my failures to help others make the choices about the things that they can and to use their skills to overcome those things that they were thrust into, that they have no control over. And when you can do that, then you're not a victim, then you're not hating, then you are really vision and purpose focused because your purpose really is a choice. And, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people don't understand that, man. It's like they think that it's something that's going to come down and hit you in the head. And it's not. It's nothing like that. So uh, just, you know, doing all I can to help people take control over their lives and not to be an innocent bystander in their own life. And when you do that, then and only then are you living your flow. (laughs) (laughs) I love this. I love this. I'm big on mission, vision, and being very clear about that and understanding what your legacy play is 20, 30 years out and being able to kind of step into that very strategically. And so I love having that vision and that purpose being very clear and being able to, you know, not idle around and oh, Schultz, peace too, man. <laughs> I love that. And I, I love that you say you're in the therapy business. That's really neat. Well, I mean, you know what? I think a lot of us have to figure out where we are. And I mean, when I told my business manager that, I think to this day, she still thinks like I'm crazy. And, you know, what do you mean you're in the therapy business? And so, you know, honestly, Stephen, it's like it's hard sometimes when you are the one that does the reading and you're reading the masters like we're studying from the masters. You're this podcast in and of itself is a is kind of an introspective look into the new masters and some of the older masters as to how we were able to attain whatever success that we've been able to attain the balance we've been able to maintain the growth, the fervor that we've been able to maintain throughout our, our careers. And a lot of people have just taken what other people have thrust on them. And, you know, my choice was my dad always told me this was like, son, to be a winner. You know, you really have to be in control of your own game. And by the way, you can be in control of your own game. Here's what you need to do. And then you read books like, you know, you read books like Think and Grow Rich. You know, some of the things that other people read, you know, the books from people, you know, again, like the Howard Schultz's of the world. You can read the books like the people like the Barack Obama's of the world. And so when you put all that together, You can't help but be successful, but also understand that there are critical points in time in our life daily as well where we have to make choices. And I was talking to a a coach today who's probably going to come in and facilitate some things with my company. And, you know, one of the things that he was asking, like, you know, I want to know your vision. I want to know where you're going. And then he said, and I want to know what's holding you back. And, you know, we don't think about the whole idea of reflection that much. And, you know, reflection at every step is the key point 
at which you gain wisdom. You know, experience itself isn't wisdom. Evaluated, reflected upon experiences are what you then can call wisdom. And the only way you can do that is to take a chance to say, well, what's holding me back? What am I doing to hold myself back? And when you take that introspective look. That is the first part of the pyramid that leads you towards, you know, self-empowerment. Love it. So let's come back to the music for a second, because that's where things really began for you. And I want want you to share some wisdom with other musicians, right? So I guess the first thing I wanted to ask you, was there a, a point where you knew you'd arrived at your signature sound? Wow, my signature sound. Yes, (laughs) Yes, <laughs> there was there was a point. It had to be about in 2001. You know what? No, it wasn't. It was even earlier than that. It was probably in 1997 huh. when I put out my first CD. And I was in Washington, D.C., and I was going around the corner at Washington Circle right by George Washington University. And I heard this car blasting some music and it came by me. And it was one of my songs playing on WHUR, the radio station here in Washington, D.C. Really? Wow. And it was a tune entitled <laughs> Maxon. And I was like, that's it. You know, they, they're digging what I'm doing. And then, you know, people are like, I know your lick. I know your lick wherever you go. You've got this little thing you do. And so from there... Definitely. Uh, that's when I knew it. You know, when people would come to me and say, I know you when I hear you play. I know it's your music when I hear this sound. And you, wow. play, you have a definite, unique approach to playing piano. Mm. And is piano the only instrument that you play? Yes, yes. I tell people I play my piano and my laptop. There are multi-instrumentalists, and I'm one who knows how to work Microsoft Excel, Microsoft PowerPoint, Word and business documents, you know, to come up with great strategies. That's my other instrument, but my main instrument is my uh, piano and keyboard. Marcus, what's the greatest downside to being a musician? The greatest downside to being a musician has to be in the fact that it is very lonely. (laughs) Mm. And I don't mean lonely from a standpoint of, you know, personal attention, physical attention, because those are some of the quote unquote, they can be some of the upsides. But it's the whole idea of nobody really understands where you want to go. And most artists don't take the time to have a or to invest in their education. And I don't mean getting a degree, but in the education of business to know how to organize, protect and then exploit their own music and their own dreams. So they're dependent upon somebody else. Other big downside is, you know, the loneliness that you have from most family members. I come from a family of doctors and lawyers, and I can guarantee you that it was not (laughs) readily accepted for Marcus to uh, what you're doing. What you're going to major in what? And, you know, it's one of those things in life when you decide that you're going to follow your passion. It's a very lonely, a very lonely journey at points until you start to demonstrate some levels of success. So Mm -hmm. I always tell musicians to think of themselves as farmers. So you have to have a seed and then you have to plant it in fertile ground. And when you do so, there's a time of an incubation period where you don't see a sprout or anything else. And you have to wait and you have to water it, even though there's nothing there. And you continue to add nutrients in and you make sure that there's a certain amount of sunlight and, you know, a certain amount of of additional water. And eventually, if you do what you're supposed to do and you invest the time, money and, you know, techniques and farming techniques or life techniques or, you know, life in the music business techniques. Techniques, then you start to see the sprouts and then you have to continue to do it over and over and over. So, you know, I tell musicians all the time that you know, people think that life is about these destinations. But the whole idea is that in between the destinations are cycles. So mm-hmm. life is linear only in the fact that you are born and that you will one day transform and transition to, you know, what we don't know. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, but in between, it's a series of cycles. And sometimes you have compounded cycles because you have personal relationships and that cycle going on, a business relationship and that cycle going on, and then a creative entrepreneurial venture cycle. And, you know, it's you have to understand that in order to manage it. But when you do, it breaks down to what I call DEPEL, which is D-E-P-E-L-L, dream, environment, plan, execute, listen, learn. At every stage in anything you do, there has to be a dream. You have to plan it in a fertile environment, meaning constructively critical, then and constructively supportive. 
then you have to actually have a written plan that you then execute. And then once you go through execution, you have to listen and learn. So dream environment plan, execute, listen, learn. And as you continue to go through that, it just starts happening naturally. And, you know, you get closer and closer to those success points. Is that the formula that's helped you to create several successful albums? Yes. As a musician? Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. I used to have studio engineers that would laugh at the fact that I would go into a studio with a calendar of the songs that I was going to do for the month. I would book my time in blocks because it was cheaper. But because I had it on a written plan, I knew that, hey, look, I could get this solo done in this amount of time. I could Mm -hmm. get these tracks done in this amount of time. It would take this song this long at this many minutes to continue to sync my sequencer up to MIDI to drop the tracks in. So Mm. they would just laugh because at the end of the day, you know, or at the end of two weeks, I could get a record done in two weeks recorded because, you know, Wednesday, you know, Brian was coming in to play sax, followed quickly by Stanley coming in and laying the guitar. But it was all in the calendar. It was all in my written plan. And, you know, after I got done with the particular studio session, then I would sit back and listen and learn. Wait a minute. Does this sound right? You know, you get your demo tape, you take it home. You're like, this is OK. Mm, maybe not. And then you have some built in time for, you know, your overdubs and what you're going to do to make sure that it sounds the way you want it to sound. And that's just the production part of it. Then you have the whole marketing plan of what you're going to do, how you're going to do a listening party, when you're going to schedule a listening party, what's going to be your single, who you're going to get to promote your single, which stores are you going to work with on consignment to get your stuff in if you don't have distribution? How are you going to plan, you know, all this stuff? I mean, it's a legitimate business. You know, the gigging aspect, legitimate business that takes ramp up time, that takes the ability for you to engage with your primary consumers, the people who are buying your music and coming to pay to see you, but your secondary consumers, those people who need to get you, who need to hire you and allow you to come into their venues. You know, so it, this is business at its most empirical level. And, you know, you go back to the question you asked me, like, what is the biggest downside is that people don't understand that this is a legitimate business with a legitimate business model. But because Mm -hmm. people don't understand it and they think it's art, they think it's like, oh, fuddy duddy. A lot of people can make a lot of money in this business of music alone Mm -hmm. if they just understand that. Well, you just laid down a blueprint, brother. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, that, That was fire. I appreciate that. So talk to me about some of the things that you've done to remain positive during, because obviously we'll all have downtimes, right? We'll all have failures on this journey. What some of the things that you do to remain positive and to be able to continue to push through when the plan doesn't work? Well, you know, you just have to, it's like anything else, man. I've seen so much and I go back to my experience with my mom and, you know, you don't expect your mom to have a stroke. So that is like a failure in a component of your expectation. It's a betrayal Mm -hmm. of a life expectation. And, you know, in the beginning, it hurts. It's hard. It's scary. That's Mm -hmm. the main thing. When you, when you're talking about business failure or personal life failure or things that bring you disappointment, they're scary and they hurt. And when you care, they hurt even more. So you get to a point where you understand, but wait, this actually means that, that I'm alive, (laughs) that I'm well, that I actually, you know, care about what I do. And by the way, failure is inevitable. So when you understand that failure is inevitable, you just put it on the side of, we lost that one. You know, playing sports is great. That's why I advocate for some level of competition and real competition, not, you know, hey, everybody wins, but real competition. You all got your butts kicked Mm -hmm. and you lost. But what's the real mission here? What can we gain out of this to go to the next one? And, you know, you may get to a point where you say, well, maybe music isn't for me. You know, maybe the wine business isn't for me. Maybe teaching isn't for me. Maybe speaking isn't for me. Okay, well, when you recognize that, that's not really a failure. That's just something that allows you to then move closer. Of course, correct. Yes, right? You know, so like, wait, we don't want to go down this path because this is not this is not my highest, best use. And I tell people all the time, when you know your limitations, you broaden your horizon. So I pull that together and I keep on stepping, man. I keep trying. I know and I'm pretty upfront with myself when a song sounds good. 
when our wine tastes good, when, you know, like my book, I knew, you know, it was, it had many redemptive qualities, many inspirational qualities for people. Things like my TED Talks, you know, there's stuff in there for everybody because I care. So whether they were failures or not, you know, didn't really necessarily matter per se, but I knew they were decent. I knew they were good enough at the bare minimum. When you get to that point and you're doing and living your passion and living your purpose, all you can either do is say, look, this is either working for me or it's not. If it's not, what are you going to do? And if it is, how are you going to make it better? Right. Love it. How much of the success of your company do you credit to the team that you've been able to build around you? (laughs) Absolutely. I mean, we haven't even really, you know, I say this tongue in cheek, but like, Not to belittle where I am right now, but we are just now looking at, you know, the light at an end of a tunnel where Mm -hmm. I haven't even really experienced success yet. The success that I see coming our way is at a whole different level. That's a blessing, right? Yeah, definitely. And it's absolutely because of my team. I have a great business manager and, you know, an operations person and uh, Sidonia Bell Walker. I just brought on a new uh, person helping me, LJ DeShields on public relations, social media and engagement on the speaking side. I have a new team that we brought on this year on the social media, specifically dealing with certain components of Facebook, Twitter, and then also their specialized music software platforms that allow you to engage your consumers in so many different ways that are actually transferable into other businesses. They've been great. My assistant, Leslie, keeps me together. And, you know, we we continue to refine. Tijuana Gray has been doing some great stuff as it relates to business development, you know. And when you put all that together, again, but you have to have a plan. And that's what I was going to say. How do you actually (laughs) go about attracting, nurturing, and empowering the right talent for the company? You know, to tell you the truth, I go out and sell it like I sell anything else. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's it's kind of interesting. When I did my first deal with Bob Johnson, one of the things Bob set me aside and told me one day is he's like, man, I didn't buy your business plan. Mm. He said, I invested into you. Right. And so you are the most important and powerful person and persuasive person to anything. I mean, I, I tell people business is like dating. You know, when you're out there, you have to come up with these strategies to let people know, like, hey, look. I'm the dude you want to be messing with. You know, here's where I'm going. And don't you want to be with me? I can take care of myself this way and I can help you take care of yourself this way. You know, I will support you in this way. No, I may not take care of you, quote unquote. If you want that kind of guy, maybe I'm not your guy. But if Mm -hmm. you want to be on a team that's going to go and change the world. And that's what I use all the time because that's my mission to change the world, to get off of this empathetic life as an innocent bystander BS that most people are living. If Mm -hmm. you want to change the world to take motivated people who just been discouraged, right, and inspire them to do what they know deep down in their soul they should be doing, then this is the team for you. Come flow with us. Love it. Love it. Love it. So you touched on this. You wrote a book, For the Love Of, which is a collection of essays containing your personal advice. What prompted you to actually put that together and write the book? Every time that I perform, I guess over the last 15, 20 years or so, I break down in the middle of the set and I begin to speak about life, current events. Mm. I have them say 30 minutes, 40 minutes into a set. You can hear a pin drop when we break down and get real soft. There's no one talking. And when I hear that, I know that's my time to then say, boom, well, that song was about this. And then I talk about something and kind of break the barrier with, you know, talking about my daughter, talking about life, talking about, you know, the ups and downs, the things I see, then break it down even more as it relates to some of the things that we should be out here doing and how to get your flow on. So in doing that over time, people have been like, uh, did you write that down? (laughs) And I was like, I didn't. Mm. So one day I was on an airplane and I was like, you know what? I have five hours between here and Los <laughs> Angeles. Let me see what I can do. And by the time I got to Los Angeles, I had a chapter and a half done. And I was like, wow, wait a minute. Okay, so it's going to take me four hours to get back. Let me see what I can get done. So after I did that, then I had two chapters fully completed. And I was like, 
oh, well, this is just like everything else that I do. Let me schedule some time to knock it out. So I did. And I got it to a point where I was like, okay, I can't do anymore. And I got a ghostwriter and a small publishing company to help me, you know, finish the book up, get the um, cover produced and to get it, you know, onto all the sites. Much like an independent music, a musician does. That was it, man. I was like, I'm going to do it. And I did it. And Amazon bestseller. And, you know, yeah, I love it. It's awesome. So you're also a very good motivational speaker. And as you said, you now deliver two TEDx talks. That's pretty dang impressive. (laughs) How do you prepare for big speeches like TED? Man, I'm going to tell you. So I teach like this semester, I'm teaching at, at Howard and teaching entrepreneurship. And I tell you, honestly, it's so easy to be able to get up there and talk because I do it. And Mm -hmm. so I'll have my lesson plan. I had my syllabus and, you know, everything was written down. I could look at my syllabus before I went into class, have my assignment ready for the end of class, and I could go in and knock it out. To try to get a point across in less than 17 minutes when people are making you go through the process of sitting down and refining your idea and saying, well, you know, we don't really think that that's what you should say say there (laughs) or we think we can get we think you can have more impact if you do this right and so then going over it and over it to make sure you don't go over 17 minutes Mm -hmm. it is the most stressful process that i've actually ever gone through the preparation preparation for the lsat was not as i didn't have as much fear for that as i did the gmat Definitely not as much. And it's just, it's scary because you know you're going up in front of the best of the best. And it's going to be memorialized. And it's going to be memorialized in a way of, did you get your point across? Did you really have something to say? Because if you had something to say, you really can say it in 17 minutes or less. And if you don't, guess what? Everybody's watching. So you're talking about, (laughs) yeah, I'm giving a TEDx talk. And if everybody's like, yeah, well, it sucks. You know, you have that weight on your shoulder as well. So um, very stressful. But they have a pragmatic approach. Again, people think that structure is the opposite of free. And what I try to explain to them, I use it in terms of the concert hall in Los Angeles, the Disney Hall. And when you go in there or look outside of it, you're like, this is like crazy. All these designs going every which way. How did they do that? They did it with a blueprint. They did it with structure. They did it with a pragmatic plan. And, you know, structure allows you to build incredible things. When it's just free, it's gas, right? So when you start putting things and you're talking about building things, you need to have a blueprint. You need to make sure that you have this structure and that the TED concept and the, the process in and of itself makes you a better leader, more organized person specifically and in general. As you, you talk about the humility of a TED Talk <laughs> and what that can do to you, how do you actually remain humble and grounded in your mission after all the success that you've had? Well, let's see. I've always been, let's look at this. I have an ego, but it's in a humble way, right? <laughs> so that's, that's what my manager always says. Like, yeah, Marcus, you have an ego on you because, you know, you see these shows out here. I was watching one the other day and they were like, this guy is a narcissist. How can a narcissist be a president? It wasn't about even contemporary times that we live in. It was something in the past. And the woman responded, well, how can you be president? and not be a narcissist, right? So Mm -hmm. the idea of people who are successful are going to have egos. They're going to have a self-concept that's more developed, at least in their minds, than those who are, you know, let's say, quote-unquote, less financially, quote-unquote, successful, or, you know, who have not been able to achieve certain levels of accoutrement. But the humility, I'm just me. So, you know, I love being around people. I love making people feel welcome. Sometimes I have to watch that because, you know, you let people in too close and they can take advantage of you. Mm -hmm. But I believe that what I've been given is a gift. And the real gift 
was given to me today when I awakened. And it happens every second or so when my heart beats and every couple of seconds when my lungs inhale and exhale, contract and relax. The fact that my brain is working, my ears are hearing, the fact that I have electricity and a good microphone and a laptop and a sound card to be able to talk into, to be able to even have this interview with you, connect like Jennifer Witter that would connect me with you. Yes. The fact that you have a platform on which that we can speak. So really what I'm doing is it's my own form of ministry. But when you understand it's a ministry, you're really taking from something else. You're taking from a higher power and saying, all I am is a vehicle for you. I'm a vehicle to make you remember who you really are mm -hmm. because most of us have forgotten. And when you realize who you are, you don't have to be humble and you don't have to be, you know, the opposite. You don't have to be, you know, uh, kind of introverted. You know, it's a matter of you can have an ego and an understanding of who you are. Yes. And if everybody just took the time and the chance on themselves to be themselves and to develop yourself, imagine the world we live in. Yes. Yes. Marcus, love it, man. You drop in some serious nuggets of wisdom. Last question for you. What's one action our trailblazers can do this week that's going to help them to begin to blaze their trail? Wow. <laughs> The one thing that they can do this week in order to blaze their trail is to sit down for however long they need to with a pen and a paper. Take the first 20 minutes and just do nothing. Don't write. Don't do anything. Just sit. And as you take that deep breath, as you get that level of silence, your brain is going to take over. After about 20 minutes, start writing down. From that, in the next 20 minutes... Decide what of those things you really want to follow up on and those things that you don't. Use that as your vision. Write down your vision and then look at your calendar and say, look, this is who I am because these are my voices, that little voice in the back of my head telling me what I've been doing. Is this because I've been conditioned to do this or is this who I am? If it's who I've been conditioned to be and it's not me, make the choice to create the new you. If it's who you are, and your vision, make sure, and this is something that's really, really important for people to do on the regular, make sure that your calendar and your schedule align with who you say you are. Mm -hmm. So if you say you are a God-fearing, great dad who loves to go out and spend time with your daughter, who's your life, and you care about your health, yet you go back on your calendar and you look at your receipts and you see that you haven't seen your daughter in a week and a half because you've been too busy, haven't hit the gym, haven't been to church in a quarter, then you need to realign those two things. Yes. And that whole values realignment piece is the number one thing that you can do to always continue, not just this week to set your trail, but to keep the trail blazing. Yes, absolutely. Marcus Johnson, thank you so very much for being our guest. You've dropped a ton of mission fuel on our Blazer Nation. And before I let you go, tell us how we can stay connected to you and we can wrap up for today. The easiest way to connect with us is our new site, MarcusJohnson360.com. You can subscribe and find out where we're performing. It has all of our social media, but it talks about everything from the wine to the books to speaking to music and where I'm going to be, where we're going to be doing wine tastings, where we're going to be performing or book signing. Everything is right there under one roof. It's MarcusJohnson360.com. Marcus, thank you so much, my brother. Hey, man. Thank you so much. I appreciate what you're doing. Well, that's it for today. Thanks again for listening to this episode of the Trailblazers podcast. I'll be posting links to all of today's book recommendations and links mentioned on our show notes page at tdpod.com. If today was your first time listening to the Trailblazers podcast, I just want to extend a warm Trailblazers welcome to you. We're so happy to have you here and we encourage you to go ahead and hit that subscribe button in your favorite podcast app. Go ahead and browse through some of our past episodes to keep the knowledge flowing. If you're a fan of the podcast and today's content, and you're maybe already subscribed to the podcast, please continue to share and invite your friends, your family, your colleagues to listen to an episode that you think might impact them most. We believe that someone listening to these inspiring stories will be moved 
to make significant changes that will have generational impact for many others, both now and well into the future. Don't miss next week's episode. New episodes are released each and every Monday by about 5 a.m. Eastern. Trailblazers, jump off this podcast today. Go find a way to rise above, go way beyond, and keep blazing your trail. Cheers. Cheers.